Okay, I think we're good. Okay, so last class I started off very depressing. So I thought, let's do a change of pace here and get some good news going. So I have always won, well, first of all, you guys saw that I was very anxious and upset, but one thing that I did to cheer myself up was to rescue a couple of doggies. So I've always wanted to adopt a bonded pair of dogs. So I've been looking and looking and looking, but my husband and I have been renters in different houses since we started dating eight years ago. So we, we could never have a pet. So anyway, here are my dogs. And what questions do you have for me about my dogs? <laughs> Anything? Yes. So these, they're two different dogs. Um, the tan one and the black one. And I guess I'll just tell you their names. Daphne is the tan lab mix, but I think she's more of bloodhound. She's like obsessed with squirrels. So I think maybe a little bit of lab, but light on the lab. And then we have a black lab mix named Lucy. I'm spelling it L-U-C-I. Any other questions? I'll say we'll talk with probably talk about therapy dogs in here at some point, but it has been so helpful. <laughs> They're so sweet. They love to cuddle. So the other day I was crying and they just came up to me. You know how dogs are very sensitive to that kind of thing. They just came up to me. And I just petted them and I felt so much better. Now they're a ton of work too, as anyone knows who's adopted a shelter dog. So of course, you know, we've had some accidents and things like that, but they're just adjusting and it's really cheered me up. So I thought, let's just start with some, some good news off the bat. Okay, so now just some reminders. Um, I changed the deadline on that Rebel assignment to Tuesday at midnight. Please just let me know if you have any technical difficulties, any problems, um, I'm happy to help with those. I don't have any control over like your login information, so I, contact support and then we'll either, we'll get a solution for you somehow. And then remember all the others are gonna be Thursday at midnight just to keep it consistent. But just let me know if you want an extension, happy to grant it. Um, one thing I forgot to put on the reminder slide is I'll send a just literally a, either one question or three question Qualtrics survey to you guys this afternoon to ask uh, just a couple of preferences kinds of things like if we do have to go online, how do you want this class to be taught um, and just a couple of other procedural things like that might be in there. Okay, any questions for me before I get into the chapter one. Yes. Just well, yes, it, that's the thing is that it will be Tuesday and Thursday because I extended the deadline. The next one will come up on Thursday. So if you can get it done by Thursday at midnight, I feel like you're just going to be less stressed. But if you need Friday or the weekend or until Tuesday, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, but yes, good question. <laughs> OK, so we're going to just start talking about chapter one and I try for every lecture to do a little outline before I get started into the chapter. This chapter is just a, a general introduction to the class and then also it has information on research met methods but I actually pushed that back to a later chapter so you guys shouldn't see that part in the revel when you're when you're reading it. You'll see that later. Okay so the first thing we need to discuss is how do we determine what is abnormal psychology? I actually hate the name of this class because as, we'll, as you'll see, um, I think something like mental health disorders or something like that, but it's just traditionally been called abnormal psychology and we'll talk about why and how do, how do we determine and who determines what is normal, what is abnormal. 
And then we're going to take a look back at abnormal psychology, but basically the treatment of mental health disorders in the past. We have a long way to go right now in this country, but you guys are going to see that we've come a long way, especially through research over time. The, thing, the ways that people with mental health disorders were treated in the past was really horrific and terrible. So we'll talk about a little bit of that, even though it's disturbing. And then we'll talk a little bit about modern mental health treatment, but that's going to be throughout the whole semester. Okay, so like I said, the word abnormal. When you hear the word abnormal, what comes to mind? So let's talk about what connotations does this have to you? And then what words do you think of? What words do we use to describe people who are abnormal? Maybe you can just kind of shout it out or raise your hand, whichever you guys want to do. Yeah, impaired function. Yeah, so something's wrong. Something's impaired. What else? Let's talk, let's do, what connotations does this, does the word abnormal have to you guys? Positive, negative, neutral. To me, I feel like if I, like if I called you abnormal or I was, I mean, we don't usually say that, right? Like, he's so abnormal or something like that. What would we usually say? He or she or they are so what? Weird. What else? Crazy is one we hear a lot, strange, right? Most of these aren't very positive words. A lot of times that's what we get. And especially with mental health disorders, one of my biggest pet peeves is just labeling someone crazy. And I will say for the women in this room, uh, which is most of us, a lot of times that is one of the oldest tricks in the book. If you have any emotions, you're crazy. Um, so that's something I hear a lot and I feel like it's used a lot of times to describe like a, a mental health symptom and it, it's very stigmatizing. So, but we've all been guilty of it sometimes as well because it's just so culturally entrenched to just say, oh, that person's crazy or something like that. So, though I don't like the word, that has been traditionally what's in place as how do we determine what is the normal as in what is the norm, okay? So not necessarily like normal as in the right way to behave, but more what is the cultural norm where we are? And then what is abnormal as far as what isn't the cultural norm? So it's kind of this like what are most people doing? And then what are less people doing is, is really what the term means, but there, but there are so many negative connotations. Okay, and so one thing that we'll talk about a lot more when we start talking about the DSM-5, which if any of you guys have heard of that, it's basically the big book that has all of the mental health disorder diagnoses in it. And one reason that it's criticized a lot is because right now the way that we diagnose disorders is you basically get asked a bunch of symptoms just like you would with like a physical health sort of disorder but it's mostly just questions and you answer and then if you check certain boxes they say okay you meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder let's say so the reason that's criticized is because actually we've kind of found with research that that's not exactly how things work. Things really operate along a continuum where there's not necessarily a clear cutoff where you either have PTSD or don't have PTSD. That's the way we treat it right now, but you could have a mild case, a moderate case, or a more severe case along a continuum. So I just realized I need to watch the time since I'm recording in front of people. Oh, wait, there's a big clock right there. That's nice. Okay. Anyway, so the, the current approach that a lot of the di diagnosis uses would be this yes, no checkbox kind of approach. So you either have it or you don't have it. But let me demonstrate why that could be a problem. So raise your hand if you have ever had anxiety, right? So like 
that is normal to have anxiety. So does that mean you have an anxiety disorder? Does that mean that you need treatment, that you need medication? Maybe, but maybe not. I mean, if you have absolutely no anxiety about anything ever, that's the thing that's abnormal, right? So it definitely exists more along a continuum. So anxiety is a good example of where you can have mild anxiety, which actually has been shown to help improve performance sometimes, moderate anxiety, or you could have severe, more debilitating anxiety. And most people though, you know, you fall somewhere on that continuum. We have the extremes, but we also have the, a lot of people, most people actually will fall towards the middle. So think of like, if you've ever seen a bell-shaped curve, a normal curve, most people will fall like in the middle of that spectrum. So just to give you guys an example, social anxiety is a good one because um, they've done studies where they ask people, what is your biggest fear? And a lot of times the number one answer is public speaking. And that actually falls under social anxiety. So there's other things that fall under social anxiety, like not being, being really uncomfortable in crowds, being really just uncomfortable when people are watching you. We'll, we'll talk about social anxiety later, but public speaking is the example I'm gonna use. So let's say we're doing this continuum of, I, I like mild, moderate, severe better, but this, this is the illustration from the book of normal to abnormal. Let's say I'm someone who has a normal, mild level of social anxiety, and I'm asked to get up here and give a presentation by myself to the class. What are some feelings that I might feel in that moment, normal feelings about presenting? Nervous. Yeah, nervous. I mean, I get nervous every time, even after I taught um, for years. So it is normal to feel nervous. What kind of thought might you have in your head? Like, why might you be nervous? Yeah, you might mess up. I might blank out. I might mess up. I might forget what I was gonna say. I might make a fool out of myself, right? Those are actually normal thoughts to have before you're presenting. And so behavior, what, what might you do if you're feeling nervous, but it's just like a mild level? Stand up for my presentation, but I yeah. Exactly. So at a normal mild level, it might actually be a good thing, right? Because you might prepare. You might run through your presentation again before you go over it. You might um, try to, you know, memorize things or have note cards ready, you know, something like that. So. At a, at a mild level, it can be a little bit helpful to have a, a normal level, mild level of anxiety. Okay, so then let's just skip over the moderate for now and go to the severe. So what might you feel if you have severe social anxiety and you have to present? Some of you might have experienced this or, or have known people who have. You might feel nauseous. I mean, you might feel physically sick. I'm someone who, when I'm anxious, it's all in my stomach. So I feel sick <laughs> when I'm anxious. Uh, and that's really common. Um, yeah, so you feel very bad and it affects you physically, which is one of the reasons we know it's more extreme because it is affecting your, your body. Um, and so what might, you, what might you be thinking to yourself? Yeah, I'm going to fail this entire class and you'll probably even go further. You'll probably say, and if I, because this is what I used to do when I was you guys of age. And if I fail the class, I'm never going to get a good job. And then I'm never going to be able to move out of my parents' house. And I'm going to live in their basement for the rest of my life. And like that is a spiral, thought spiral. So that is what you'll do if you have, if you have a lot of anxiety. And then what might your behavior be? So on edge, right? So nervous. So you'd, you'd see it. You'd see. So in physical signs of anxiety, especially extreme, you're going to see a lot of fidgeting, a lot of pacing like I was doing the first day of class. You'll see it physically somewhere in their body. So uh, what else, what might you do at the very extreme? Like you, you really feel like you can't do it. 
you might run out the room. I've seen people do that. So I've seen people so anxious that they, that they run out of the room, you know, and they can't, they can't cope with it. They're severely anxious at that moment. I've had people drop classes before because they know they had to give a presentation. Um, we're not doing presentations this semester, but I always encourage students to just come talk to me and see if there's anything else we can do, like set up a small group presentation or just do it for me and, you know, something like that. So I think that there, that is, that is an extreme behavior that people do though, is drop a class or take an online class instead. So that's how you would know that it's, that it's more extreme. It's affecting you a lot more. And then in, in the middle, we have, again, kind of a little bit up the ante from, from, my, from the mild, but not so severe that you're dropping the class or running out of the room. Any questions? Okay. So then how do we determine what is a mental health disorder? So what level that we just talked about is, would we consider that an anxiety disorder? You have social anxiety disorder. So that is the kind of the next thing I want you guys to think about is what is your definition of a mental health disorder? Just take a minute to jot this down. This isn't something you're going to turn in. Um, well, you might turn it in with your thought question, but I'm not going to read it. <laughs> uh, so just what is your definition of a mental health disorder? Okay, you don't have to give me the whole definition, but what are some things you included? We've already, we had impaired functioning earlier, which is, which is a good one. What are some other things you think of? Yeah. So something that it's like, you know that the outcome's not gonna be good, but you can't stop yourself from doing it kind of thing. And that's like, that is something with mental health disorders. You know, people sometimes get frustrated with people who have mental health disorders. They're like, why are you doing that? But it's like, you're not doing it on purpose. You have a mental health disorder, right? So yeah, definitely those self-defeating behaviors are part of it. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, danger. That is going to, we're going to talk about four D's of abnormality, and that's one of them is dangerous behavior. So you're either a danger to yourself. So this is things like an eating disorder, like anorexia, where you could actually die from not eating for a very extended period of time, self harming behaviors, cutting, burning, that type of behavior, or suicidal behaviors as well. Or you could be a danger to others. So we'll talk about something called antisocial personality disorder. And at the very, very extreme of that disorder is what we think of as serial killers. Um, that's again, the extreme, but you might be, you might not be necessarily as bothered by it, but you're a danger to society in that case. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, maladaptive. So that's actually really rounds up all of the all of the the things we've said so far, and then more that we'll talk about is that they're all maladaptive behaviors. So what does that mean? We assume that as as a mental health clinician, as a clinical psychologist, we assume that people are entitled to living a mentally healthy life, right? So as much as possible to living a life. That, that you enjoy, that you, you have some, you know, positive feelings in your life. 
And so maladaptive means it's causing you to not have those positive feelings. It's causing you distress. It's causing you poor mental health, essentially. So yeah, maladaptive really is the word that wraps all of those things together. And so one thing that I think is really interesting, and we could do a whole class on this, but just to get you guys thinking about this, in what way are mental health disorders the same as a physical health disorder or a medical illness? So first let's do, in what ways are they similar? Absolutely. So they both get in the way of doing things that, that you want to be able to do or that you, that would lead to you having this sort of positive mental health, right? Um, both physical and mental health symptoms get in the way of you living the life you want to live, basically. How else are they similar? Yeah. Absolutely. So there's so much research that's been done, I would say in the past decade, on this mind-body connection. I'm a huge believer in this because of the research, but also just personally. When I'm upset, it is physical. Like I will feel sick and I'll get sick easier too. So that's one thing that's really interesting is that your immune system unfortunately doesn't work as well when you have depression, stress, anxiety, other mental health disorders. And so it is so intimately, they are so intimately connected. Okay, but let's switch gears a little bit. Well, how are they different or, or are they? What is, what is a difference? Yes. With both? Well, okay, right. So with physical health disorders, right, typically we have like a medical treatment, right? We have a pill you could take, a medication, right? We have surgery that you can get. There's a solution that we can say, you have this, this is the treatment for this, like chemotherapy, for example. Now it may or may not go away, right, with that treatment, but you have a treatment plan and it's usually pretty straightforward, although sometimes with things like chronic pain, like fibromyalgia, kind of pain disorders, it's actually not straightforward at all. Um, but that's also a combination of like mental, physical as well. But yeah, with most things, it's like, here's your diagnosis for physical health, and here's how we treat it. It's a little murkier with mental health. You have a lot of different opinions on how you should treat depression, for example, right? So some people think you should definitely be on a medication. Some people think you should just do therapy. Some people think you don't need any of that and you just shouldn't talk about it and just ignore it, right? There's a lot of different, um, like the suck it up kind of mentality. There's a lot of different views on how, what we should do with depression. Any, any other ways that they're different? Uh, with mental is not as severe. Yes, say more about that. Um, so Go into the ER with, let's say, stomach pain or the x-ray you go to do all the time. Yes. Look exactly where the issue is, even if they don't have a way to treat it immediately. With mental, it's you have to build that trust with therapists. You're willing to open up. Yes. You're willing to dive deeper in to even touch on what the process is that you try to put in. Definitely. So I love, I, I need to remember to repeat what you guys are saying because these two, you guys out there, hi, can't hear. Um, so I'll start doing that. So, so one of the differences is that there's more of a straightforward way to test for physical health disorders, right? So you have an x-ray, you have an ultrasound, you have whatever it is. You don't have that. There is no blood test with mental health disorders. We have fMRI, which has come a really long way, but it's even if you look at the fMRI research, it's actually not you have this or you don't have this just by looking at, at the MRI, unless it's something really obvious, like a neurological disorder. The brain in someone who's mildly depressed versus someone who's severely depressed, you can scan them. You might see some subtle differences, but it's not a clear cut, yes or no. 
So I love being a clinical psychologist, but it's hard. I mean, you have to make the diagnosis and you only have the patient or client's report to go off of. You don't have a blood test um, to determine, yes, this person has flu strain B or something like that. And so what do you guys think are the positives of viewing them both as the, as the same or similar? Yeah. Mental health is taken more seriously, right? If, if you see that as something very similar to a physical health disorder. So that's what's interesting is a lot of us feel comfortable, especially right now, but in general, taking a day off work because we have a fever, right? We tell our boss we have a fever or we have the stomach flu. But how many times have you guys felt comfortable saying, I'm feeling depressed today. I'm feeling severely anxious. I mean, some of you might, I think your generation is getting better with recognizing the crossover effects, but like in my parents' generation, they didn't even, there was no mental health disorder. They didn't talk about it. They didn't say anything. And that would have been laughed at if you said, I'm, I'm struggling with my depression too much to come into work today. So I definitely think that it's taken more seriously if we see it as very similar to a physical health disorder. But what could be the cons of that? Do you guys see any possible cons of equating them as the same? Yes, yeah, so using it as a means to get out of something, and especially those of us with anxiety disorders, the big, one of the biggest symptoms is avoiding. We wanna get out of stuff that makes us anxious because it makes us anxious and we feel like crap. So we're like, oh, we could avoid this and get out of it. And that becomes a, a cycle. You avoid it and you feel this flood of relief because, oh, I got out of that thing I didn't want to do. But then it just gets bigger and bigger in your head. <laughs> and you start building it up like, oh, I can't do this. But you can do it, but you tell yourself you can't do it and you keep, you, it's a pattern, basically. So yeah, it can be that if you see this as something that is exactly like a physical health disorder and you need to take a day off every single time you feel anxious you usually don't push yourself through it so that's a that's a possible con for sure anything else yeah yes yes absolutely so a lot of times when we equate the two what do you think the treatment is if, if you view them the same Medicine. So what you need is you need a pill. You need medicine. Whereas, first of all, I'm definitely not anti-medicine. Let me just say that right now. But the social and cultural components are so important. So that's why we know that medications for depression help 50% roughly of people recover from depression. There's another 50% who takes the same medication and doesn't get better because we haven't changed their social circumstances. We haven't changed what's going on in their life, right? So medicine can be so helpful, but we also need to take all of the other components into account. And we often don't do that if we just say, well, it's basically like the flu. You just, you take your medicine, well, for flu, Tamiflu or whatever, I guess, and then get better. It's, it's different. You need to look at all the components. Now, some would argue that in medicine, we need to do a better job of paying attention to the social and cultural components as well, right? But definitely in mental health, it's critical. Absolutely. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gear. Well, not yet. <laughs> okay, so then what does the DSM-5 that, that a lot of times people call it the Bible of psychology or psychiatry, because it has every diagnosis. What does it say about a mental health disorder? So I'll just read this to you. Definition, a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, so thoughts. Anytime I say cognition, think thoughts. Emotion regulation or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. So that impaired functioning is huge with mental disorders. Usually associated, and I bolded this, 
significant distress or disability in social, occupational, or other important activities. You guys did great with this because we've already said, gets in the way of doing what you want to do in your life, which is essentially what this says. Importantly though, an expectable or culturally approved response to a common stressor or loss, such as death of a loved one, is not a mental health disorder. So unfortunately in the past, one thing that we haven't done a good job of is realizing that first of all, some things are normal reactions and we don't need to what we call pathologize it. We don't need to overdiagnose people who are just struggling with normal symptoms. This pandemic is a great, a great example um, of this kind of thing. It is normal to be distressed, anxious, right now especially this the past few months you know so if you're experiencing those symptoms i wouldn't diagnose you with pandemic stress disorder right now i really think that that it's a normal reaction now if you're so stressed you haven't left your house in six months okay that's different right but if you're just feeling a little over a little or a lot overwhelmed by what's going on I, again i don't think it's helpful to give you oh you have a mental health disorder now necessarily and then something like grief as well. You know, grief, losing someone is hard. It's extremely hard and you're not gonna feel okay for a while. It's one of those times it's okay not to be okay and we don't need to give you a disorder necessarily. Okay, and some the other thing here that's really important is that we need to take culture into consideration. So a lot of times we operate on this Western mindset. Anything that's not normal in America, we were like, oh, that's, that's weird, that's strange, that's abnormal maybe even for that. And we might, we might say, oh, that person is crazy. <laughs> but it's actually something that's normal in their culture. So that's something we really need to think about. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys some scenarios. We usually do this in groups, but today we'll just write it on your own paper. And I want you to say if you think the behavior is normal or abnormal and why. If you think it's abnormal, could you think of any situation where it's normal? Okay, so here are your examples. Woman slapping a child, woman making a shrine to her dead husband, man barking like a dog, woman refusing to eat for several days. Um, I need like a split screen. So it's normal, abnormal, And then could you ever consider it normal in any situation? Those are the, the two questions. All right, so if it, it's okay if you're not all the way finished, but let's just go through each one. So a woman slapping a child, normal or abnormal? Context. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you're gonna, so context, you're gonna find with each of these, right? But especially this one, that you can't give a clear answer, normal or abnormal, because the context is so important. So. What is a context that we in America may consider normal for slapping a child? Yes, this is, right, exactly. So there's so many contextual factors. So a spank on the bottom, something like that. Now, I'm not saying that's right, 
but especially in the South, it's a really common method of disciplining a child. You get a spanking. So we probably wouldn't think too much of it, especially if it's a little slap on the bottom. There's obviously no marks, bruises, anything like that. That's not normal, but something like a, a not severe spanking. But then when might, might we consider that very abnormal? Yeah, just like for no reason whatsoever. Not as not as a punishment, not to teach a lesson. Yeah. Someone else's child. That's not, you know, that's not normal. That's not good. <laughs> it's gonna get in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, it again, like we said, if it's severe, then again, that's something that we don't want to encourage. Um, and could be definitely abnormal and need to be reported in that case. How about a woman making a shrine and offerings to her dead husband? Normal or abnormal? Let's say just like westernized, usually. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So again, context, right? So in some cultures, it's actually, it would be normal not to do this. Um, it, it depends. It depends on your cultural expectation. Is this something that is just done um, in your culture, in your religion, in your family? Is it a grave site where you have a shrine? Like what's a shrine, right? So there's a lot of different, uh, different ways to interpret this. Is this leaving flowers and pictures next to someone's grave site? Is that a shrine? Because that, that's normal. We, that's very typical. Um, a man barking like a dog. <laughs> Abnormal, mostly. I'm so glad you said that because that's the example that the book gives. I don't know if it's this book or another one I read. It's in Native healing rituals um, in different countries that, that that is normal. And yeah, exactly what you said, that it can be a sign of respect respect for people that did I get that right the villages I've been to it's the men that are allowed to perform the barking during the ritual are considered the highest respected yes. men in the village so it's an honor to be able to do that so that's such an interesting experience for you to have I'm glad you got to see that right so most of the time just on your regular street you hear someone barking when you're you know on campus that's going to be abnormal but if we're in a different country and it's a it's a ritual, it might be totally normal. Any other ones you guys can think of as normal there? I thought of like somebody with yeah. Well, last year, you know, I'm living in Australia, but I know yeah. like, there was a fraternity sporting event and all the Barking, yeah. Well, sometimes like football teams, you know, like let's say your mascot is like it's one of the barks or like yeah, fraternity group kind of gatherings, you might hear that. Um, being goofy, someone who has a new dog, you're like, woof, woof. <laughs> yes, exactly. So there, there are occasions where, where it's normal, but, but yeah, again, context. And the last one, a woman refusing to eat for a few days. Mm hmm Yes, so I heard so I heard both here. It could be normal, could be abnormal. Exactly. So if it's fasting, it could be it could be a cleanse, it could be religious, which would be super normal. Um, but it also could be dangerous or unhealthy. If it's something where you're depriving yourself and not for like health reasons or anything like that, but you're just not eating to be thin, and that goes on and on and on, right? Because then it could get into an eating disorder situation. So all of this, the context really matters. You guys did really good with identifying these different scenarios where it actually, it could be considered normal. And we just need to think of, think like that. If you are treating someone for a mental or physical health condition, because you don't want to give them a disorder when it's actually normal in their context or diagnose them with a disorder. You're not giving them one.
Okay, so here's a, an actual clinical example of a client. So you, let's say you are working as a therapist and you have a client who's a 48 year old man who soils himself. Normal or abnormal? Generally. It's not, I mean, usually 48 year old man is, isn't going to, but what factors could make this behavior normal? You say medical issues? Yes, absolutely, medical issues. Anything else? Right, so if you have medical issues, I'll give you some additional info on this person. He had a severe head injury. He had a long and severe history of substance use. He lived in a residential care facility requiring 20 hour, 24 hour supervision. In that context, a 24 hour supervision residential facility, normal, right? I mean, it happens. I had a client that I was treating who had, um, who had colon cancer and he was recovering. Normal, that's actually really common. And then also this idea of cultural relativism, really important to not just judge something by our Western standards. So we do this too often and I think we need to just really take a step back and consider the cultural norms by asking your clients questions about their culture, meaning what are, what is normal to them personally? So an example I give here is in, in a lot of cultures, families actually sleep together in one room. They co-sleep and sometimes in the same bed. In the U.S., if you didn't ask about any of that and you just heard, oh, I sleep with my, I don't know, 15-year-old son or something like that, that, you know, we'd be like, oh, red flag or something. But it might not be a red flag if you consider the culture, oh, we came from a country where this is totally normal and right now we're living in a really small house or, you know, there's circumstances that could make this normal. So here's another example. Let's say that you're a doctor, a therapist, whatever, and you are told by your client that they've been hearing voices of their dead grandparent occasionally. They have no other symptoms like a hallucination or delusion. That's what we consider psychosis. How do we interpret and understand this? Should we say, oh my gosh, you have schizophrenia? Or what, what should we ask? What should we do? Yeah, that's a really important part. What is the voice telling you to do? What are you hearing? Is the voice telling you to harm someone, which is a case where we would be concerned? Or are you hearing phrases that your grandma used to tell you? Did I say grandparent? Yeah, that your grandparent used to tell you. That's normal, you hear them in your head. <laughs> you know, we all do that when, we, when we've lost a loved one. They're like, they're in our heads still. Yeah. So we don't wanna say, wow, that's, that's really weird and you, there's something wrong with you. It's like, no, that might be totally normal for that person. Ask them questions. Okay, now, and I know I'm not gonna get through all of these slides today, because I'm, I'm gonna end at 1045, so um, I'll get through as much as I can. We've already talked about some of these though, and don't, I'm gonna talk about each of these individually, so you don't need to get anything on this slide right here. I just wanted to introduce the concept of these four Ds of abnormality. It's a little confusing because I actually think your Rebel book has like another D or something, but these are the four that I think are really important. So the four Ds of abnormality that I want you guys to know are dysfunction, distress, deviousness, and dangerousness, and now we'll go through each one. So dysfunction, we've talked about this already. This is just another label for it. Anything, behavior, thoughts, feelings that interfere with you doing what you want to do. So we all have things we want to do in life each day. If you're experiencing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that aren't allowing you to do those things, we'd call that dysfunctional because they're interfering with your functioning. And the more dysfunctional thought, feeling, or behavior is, the more likely it'd be considered quote-unquote abnormal or disordered by a professional. So, well, this is not a good one during the pandemic, but normally spending a lot of time per day washing hands, 
showering, cleaning. I really should have changed my example for this one. Before COVID, doing that for hours on end per day or like 100 times a day, that would have maybe been considered dysfunctional, especially what disorder do you guys think of stereotypically where people do that a lot? Yeah, and so a lot of people have said, oh, I'm feeling so OCD, or maybe people have OCD, and so the pandemic has been difficult. But right now, we're actually kind of all doing this. I mean, I want you guys, if you wash your hands 100 times a day, I'm full of that right now. Maybe not 100, but when you've touched stuff. So we have, we have behaviors that are normal a lot of times, but if you do it so much that you're washing your hands until your skin is rubbed raw, you are missing classes, because you're in the bathroom washing your hands. You can't leave the house until you've washed your hands 10 times, okay? Th that's when it's more extreme because it's interfering with what you wanna do in your life. So it's dysfunctional. That's all one of the things we're looking for to call something a disorder. Distress, so this is, this is huge. I mean, if you or someone else is not distressed by your thoughts, feelings, or behaviors, you probably don't have a mental health disorder, right? So this is something that is debated, but it's not bothering you and it's not bothering society or anyone else. It's okay to be a little strange. I mean, we don't have to tell everyone who's strange that they're disordered, right? Um, so this is, this is a big one. Are you distressed or are other people distressed? So we've already talked about this, but I mean, a characteristic of a mental health disorder is that it's distressing, it's upsetting to you. Or it could be upsetting to other people as well. Um, eating disorders is a good example where one of the actual criteria we'll talk about with anorexia is that you do not recognize how severe it is. So you are, are not that distressed by it, but your family members, friends, loved ones are incredibly distressed. And um, so, it doesn't always have to be the person. Substance use is another good example there. Deviance. This isn't what we normally think of as deviant. We normally think of illegal or immoral behavior. But what we mean here, and for this deviance, we're meaning that it deviates from the cultural or social norm. So most of the time in America, I would say, it's less culturally normal to have tattoos all over your face or tons of piercings. In some settings though, that might actually be normal and in some cultures as well. But that's what we're talking about is, is it the norm? And that's like a statistical thing, honestly. How many people in society have tattoos all over their face. Not very many in our current room, right? So it's, it's kind of, is it the norm? And that's what we mean by deviant. Doesn't mean good or bad. I think we need to get out of that kind of mindset. It's not moral or immoral. It's not good or bad. Dangerousness we've already talked about. So yes, danger. You're a danger to yourself, you're a danger to others. That's when we start not when we start, but that's when we know something is disordered. You could actually hurt yourself. You could hurt someone else. And I've given lots of examples of this already. And then that's where they all come together, that, that word maladaptive. So they all come together and they're considered maladaptive because adaptive, right, would be that it's a good thing that's helping you live your life. So maladaptive, it's not helping you live the life you want to live. Okay, I normally show a short video and I'm gonna do it to give myself a little break from talking. So I'll show like four or five minutes of this. This is a video, a longer video, but I'll just show a little bit of some treatments that we used to give to people who had mental health disorders. Well, that's interesting. Where's my bar? I'm right at the bottom of your screen. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so you get the idea. There's a lot more. Um, and the video is linked if you're interested in this kind of thing and want to see what else. I'm going to turn the lights up just a little so we don't fall asleep. You guys can always let me know if you want darker or more lighter or whatever. Okay, so basically, in the past, before kind of modern age psychological research and mental health research on treatments, we had basically three different theories of how you should treat mental health disorders or where they came from. So what's causing them? We have biological theories, supernatural theories, and psychological theories. And throughout the different time periods, there was more or less emphasis on one of these. And they've historically been thought of as like three separate things that I talked about earlier in class. Today we recognize, besides the supernatural, although in some cultures that's still normal, that it's, that's a, it's a combination of psychological, biological, social. So I just, I'm not going to talk about these again, because these were the ones you just saw in the video. So the trepanation, and then also sometimes exorcism as well, and the bloodletting with leeches, and um, just like cutting as well. Hey, sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to pull up your mask. <laughs> sorry, I just, that's okay. I know sometimes that happens. And if, again, if you guys need to step out, I'm just pretty nervous about it. Okay, so demon possession is another one that was really common, especially in, even in the church, right? So in the past, you'd have basically priests um, do performing exorcisms in the past, and that was thought of, and sometimes even still now, as a way to get rid of 
whatever, you know, spirit or devil that is causing these mental health symptoms. And then people who they couldn't cure through exorcism were often put in asylums. Just a little word on asylums. I also have a video linked here if you want to watch a video of like the top 10 worst asylums from the past or something. But basically asylums, people were kept in decrepit, horrible conditions. They were locked in cages, chained up. People even would like pay to come see asylums as like a tourist attraction kind of thing. Like, oh, look at all these sick, deranged people. It was very nasty. People weren't properly cared after at all. Very sad. Witchcraft is another one. It's like hard for us to believe now, but back in this time, especially if you were a woman who was exhibiting extreme mental health symptoms, you were called a witch. And they had this great way of determining if you were a witch called the water float test, where they tie, bound your hands and feet together, throw you into a body of water. If you float, then you're a witch. If you sink, then you weren't a witch, but you also die. So that's how they cleared your name, basically, um, from being a witch. So terrible, and just, I hate thinking about how we used to treat people who have mental health disorders. And I mean, usually, yeah. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I figure that they would go get you because you're not a witch, right? You're cleared now and your family can bury your body or whatever. But yeah, I don't actually know that for sure. But yeah, I mean, you know, during this time, people were burned at the stake and just really horrible stuff. And I mean, we're talking about things like it would be symptoms that sadly, something like hallucinations and delusions. So maybe a severe schizophrenia type of disorder. There was no treatment. There was no schizophrenia. So, and one of the worst medical treatments that was given, and this was by doctors who were the highest level of doctors up until the 1930s. I'm not back in 1500 anymore. I'm in the 1900s and the prefrontal lobotomy. This is how they cured severe mental disorders. They would take basically an ice pick type instrument, stick it up someone's nose, and sever the connections in their brain. Okay, so how do you guys think that went? I mean, they didn't have their mental health symptoms anymore, but they also couldn't talk, couldn't function, could only grunt afterwards, but they were, they were docile. So here's um, an example. A case example. So interestingly, one of the Kennedys, right, a super prominent family in this country had really some mental health symptoms, but again, they weren't recognized as mental health symptoms. It's believed now that she probably had an IQ around 70, so she had some developmental disabilities as well. And in school, they couldn't control her, basically. So she, you know, she had outbursts a lot, and they just, they took her to the doctor and they said, you know what, what you need to do is give her a lobotomy. This is going to calm her down. She was sent to get a lobotomy at age 23. And then afterwards, she had to be sent to a mental institution just to learn how to brush her teeth again. She couldn't, she couldn't function. She didn't know how to do anything. They severed your brain at that point. She no longer recognized any of her brothers anymore. And you know, now she, she wasn't having outbursts, you know, but she could just shriek, scream, or grunt. So just a super sad example of, you know, there wasn't research in this time. I'm going to harp on research a lot in a couple of lectures because um, that's what I do, but there wasn't any research. So they said, this worked for my patient and that's all they needed. This worked for this guy, so let's do it with these people, right? So it's it was it's tough there's a video on the slides that i'm not going to show because it's pretty disturbing and i don't even like watching it but if you're interested in seeing what a lobotomy looks like it looks like for some reason you can't click on this video anymore but you can um youtube that's where i got it from ice pick lobotomy if you're the kind of person who likes um seeing that kind of stuff some people who are going to become nurses or physicians don't mind that kind of thing at all 
Okay, so we've come a long way. We don't do any of this stuff anymore. Thank the Lord. But why have we come a long way? So one thing is the development of medication. That's been huge. I mean, especially for people with severe mental health disorders, medication can be life-changing for a lot of people. There was also a patient's right mo rights movement where basically we recognized that those asylums were terrible and so people were no longer kept there. There was this huge emphasis on deinstitutionalization. So instead of basically just locking up people in mental hospitals, we moved them to things like community treatment centers, going to see a, a psychologist or a therapist, not in a confined space and living at home. But we're not, we're far from perfect right now, okay? So I wanted to give you guys some statistics from the National Academy of Mental Illness. So about 26% of homeless adults staying in shelters right now with serious mental illness and an estimated 40% live with severe mental illness and a substance use disorder. So a lot of our homeless population actually have mental health disorders. And what are we doing about it? <laughs> it's hard. 20% of state prisoners, 21% of local jail prisoners have a history of mental health disorders or mental illness. So it's like we deinstitutionalize, but how many people are we putting in jail who have mental health disorders? And are, and are we giving them treatment? Are we helping? <laughs> Mostly no. 70% of youth in the juvenile justice system have at least one mental health condition. And again, if we're focused on treatment and rehabilitation, then that could be a good thing if we're really working hard on treatment. But are we or are we punishing, right? So there, there's a lot of stuff that, that we need to do better as a society. Only 41% of adults with a, a diagnosed or a diagnosable mental health condition actually receive any kind of mental health service in the past year. Most people aren't getting treatment for their mental health. Okay, so that's a problem because that trickles out not just to the person, but to their family, to their community, to society. Okay, and then one thing, and I am gonna finish on time. I'm, I'm pretty proud right now. So one thing that is highly debatable is what happened in the 1990s. We moved to a system called managed care. And what that is, was to try to have some way to streamline people's mental health services in a way similar to physical health services. So what did that mean? That means the insurance companies get to determine what mental health treatments are covered and how many sessions you can have. How many are they gonna cover at least? I mean, you can always pay out of pocket, but does anyone happen to know like the average cost of a one hour therapy session with a psychologist? It really depends, but without insurance, it's, you know, could be like $150, would be like a normal fee. If you're going to do that once a week to treat your mental health, yikes, that is going to be incredibly expensive. What if you need to go three times a week because you're really severe? I mean, it's, it's not feasible for most people. So this can range from total control over what's paid for Sometimes it's more partial and they work with the medical provider. There's usually in every therapy office, there's someone hired to deal with the insurance company in every single one. There's, you know, this is trying, the, the idea was let's not lock people up. Let's have them in the community and get treatment and then go, they can go home and sleep at night. But let's determine, you know, what services need covered so the system isn't flooded. Because there, there would not be enough mental health providers right now if everyone was getting once a week therapy. So they do, we need a system. But is this the system we want to go with? So that is your thought question for today. So what I, when it says thought question, that means answer this question on a sheet of paper. I forgot to bring my little box, so I'll probably just have you guys... Leave them where you, mm, I'll probably have you drop them off on this table at the end of the class and then I'll figure out a sanitized way to transport them. So what do you think? Should insurance companies be able to decide which mental health treatment services will be covered and how many sessions a person should get? You can say why or why not or pros and cons, however you want to answer. 
you don't need to write me like a novel, but just, you know, whatever you think. And just as a reminder, I'm gonna post this exact question on Blackboard for anyone who wasn't in class. So if you ever miss class, you just answer it on Blackboard and that's how you get credit. It'll be under discussions, discussion board. We'll start the next class talking about our answers to this. So no rush, but when you're done, you can just set the paper on the front desk. <laughs> 